Good morning, and welcome to Five Action News. We are your hosts. I'm Oriana. And I'm Tommy. Today we'll be discussing imperialism. But Tommy, what do we know about imperialism? Not much. That's why we'll have Janie be our expert on this topic. So let's go to Janie to discuss more about imperialism and how it affected the United States. Let's go! Thank you, Tommy and Oriana. Hello, my name is Janie, and I will be further explaining imperialism. Imperialism has been a common practice which consists of the capture of new territories or of small nations by a world power. The motives for imperialism in the 18th century all the way to the 20th century were economic, exploratory, and political motives. Although imperialism was a common practice in most parts of the world, there are people who opposed it. In the 19th century, the Republicans in the United States of America imposed imperialism because they believed that it went against the right for a country to be governed by its own people. After the United States was granted freedom from England, they started to imperialize. The first expansion that the United States sought out was the area of Texas and other areas that were, were gained with the Louisiana Purchase. They wanted the land because that allowed the United States colonies to move westward, where the soil was better, so the United States could elevate their economic status through agriculture. After the United States succeeded in getting the territories, they started to gain interest in other territories, such as the territories in Central America. Because the Central America land zones had vast natural resources and vast soil, which could harvest crops that have never been seen in America. But also another interest that the United States had was its proximity not only to America, but also to the sea, which provided for better trading routes and for the better economy of the United States. After America won some foothold in Central America, especially in the Panama area, they decided to build the Panama Canal, so that trade coming in from the Pacific Ocean could go directly to the United States territories near Panama, without ever crossing any land and without ever encountering any natives of the area. Now we go to James to further discuss imperialism and the conflicts it caused in America. Thank you, Jane. There are three main tensions that led to the Spanish-American War. The tension all started with Cuba's need for independence from Spain, causing the Ten Year War until 1878, resulting in Spain signing the treaty giving Cuba limited control over their government. The treaty was favored by the new Cuban government. Some tensions were not satisfied. One being Jose Marti, who led an expedition to seize power over Cuba and restart the revolution against. Another huge tension leading the Spanish American War was the U.S.'s economic interest in Cuba. In late 1897, the U.S. plunged into a great economic depression and saw Cuba as an easy way out of the situation. The U.S. declaring war on Spain was more or less out of outrage. On February 15, 1998, the U.S. S. Spain was sent to protect American civilians and was mysteriously sunk that same year. blamed by the American media for the sinking of the U.S. S. Maine, causing both countries to declare war on each other. More on this war with Thank Janet. you, James. I am Janet, and I am on the very hill where the Battle of San Juan Hill took place decades ago. I, in my segment, I am going to inform you of the events that happened during the Spanish-American War which include the Battle of Manila Bay, the Battle of San Juan Hill, and the Treaty of Paris. First is the Battle of Manila Bay, the first battle of the war. In April 1898, the commander George Dewey and his U.S. Asiatic squadron sailed at seven ships to battle the inferior Spanish Pacific Fleet in the Philippines. The battle was easily won by the United States, who killed 400 Spanish sailors and destroyed 10 warships, leaving with barely a scratch. This victory led to U.S. eventually controlling Manila Bay and purchasing the Philippines. One of the other few and important battles during the war was the Battle at San Juan Hill. One month after the battle at Manila Bay, both the Spaniards and Americans traveled to Cuba with the intent of controlling the area and the city of Santiago. U.S. General William Shafter ordered the troops to take San Juan Hill, Kettle Hill, and the village of El Caney. The, the Americans expected an easy victory since there were only 500 Spanish combatants up against their 8,000 soldiers but the battle was anything but easy. After a long and bloody battle, Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders successfully gained control of the hill, which resulted in Spain surrendering Cuba to the United States. The event that finally ended this war was the signing of the Treaty of Paris. On December 10, 1898, representatives from the U.S. and Spain met in France and signed the Treaty of Paris, which officially ended the Spanish-American War. The treaty gave the United States control over Puerto Rico, Guam, and Cuba, and allowed the U.S. to purchase the Philippines for $20 million. The treaty also destroyed the Spanish Empire, since all the country's overseas control was given to the U.S. After this commercial break, Julia will teach us about the post-war effects that the Spanish-American War had on the countries involved. This brief commercial is brought to you by the Imperialistic People of North America Association. Philippines, such a beautiful country, isn't it? With its luscious plant life and dense culture. But sadly, it has one unalienable problem. It is not an American territory. 
This month, you can help the Philippines by going to www.imperialisticpeopleofnorthamerica.com and typing in hashtag I want the Philippines to be American. Every hashtag you submit, our association will give a dollar to go out towards the fund to imperialize the Philippines. Go submit your hashtags now and help the Philippines. Hi, I'm Julia and we're back and I'll be speaking to you about countries we gained due to imperialism and the Spanish-American War. As briefly as stated by Janet, the Treaty of Paris gave us Guam, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Cuba. I'll be speaking about Guam, the Philippines, Cuba, Alaska, and Hawaii. We gained Guam a year after the war started in June of 1898. The main reason for getting Guam was to get the Philippines since they are only 1,500 miles apart. The annexing of the Philippines was much more controversial. Some believed it should be so that no other countries could control it, and some believed not to annex it because it was immoral and unconstitutional. In the end, the country was annexed, but after that it was Donald's food sailing. Enter the Filipino-American War. The leader of the Filipino Rebellion was Emilio Aguinaldo, who started the Filipino Rebellion against the Spanish. Overall, the three-year revolution was an immoral and horrible war, the U.S. doing horrible things like burning villages and implementing torture on guerrilla fighters. The Filipinos were not innocent either. They tortured, captured soldiers, and terrorized citizens siding with the U.S. Overall, the U.S. lost 4,200 people and the Filipinos lost 200,000. In the end, though, the U.S. granted the Philippines its independence in 1946. This came from the Treaty in Paris at the end of the Spanish-American War. It is 90 miles from Florida, so it was the perfect spot to have a close trading partner to help in our conquest we had at the time, to control the seas. This was also known as the maritime control. Like Hawaii, which I'll talk about later, it was a big in the sugar industry. It was a big trader with the U.S. even before the Spanish-American War. After it, the U.S. gave Cuba its independence as long as they could still intervene in the country's affairs. The U.S. and Cuba's relations have been more strained after the rebellion led by Fidel Castro, but under the Obama's administration, we have full diplomatic relations again. Alaska was brought from Russia when it was close to bankruptcy on March 30, 1867, when Secretary William H. Seward signed the treaty with Russia for $7.2 million, a very cheap price. Congress was not too pleased with this, calling it Seward's Folly and Seward's Icebox. Everyone liked it when they found gold there in 1898, bringing an influx of people to Alaska. Hawaii has been influenced by the U.S. since before we annexed it. The sugar industries were big in Hawaii, and the U.S. farmers moved there to earn money, so the U.S. affected Hawaii's culture greatly. So much so that a new Hawaiian constitution allied the U.S. to have a navy base at Pearl Harbor. However, Lula Kalani takes over Hawaii in 1891 and changes the constitution, so she had the most power and cut ties with the U.S. Because of this, American planters led by Sanford Ballard overthrew her and Hawaii became a state. And now back to our hosts, Tommy and Oriana. Thank you, Julia, for your conclusion to this topic. Uh, so obviously imperialism has greatly infected the United States. You are so right, Tommy. But either way, Stay tuned next week, where we will be discussing other topics that have greatly affected the United States. But for now, I'm Oriana. And I'm Tommy. Wishing you a great rest of the day.